So uh, after my thanks to Bansi Sabur, I may share with you that India is the home of second largest number of adults living with diabetes. One in 18 are diabetic. 17 million people are diabetics. More than 57 percent people with diabetes are undiagnosed and people die from diabetes related causes almost 3,000 deaths per day. Now the issue is that management of diabetes is an art. We need to have a wonderful treatment protocol, which drug, when to give, which drug is more effective, when to introduce insulin. It is very important. And relatively, India has a unique thing. We has a relatively earlier type two diabetes onset, higher insulin resistance Indians have and greater insulin secretory Sorry. defect we come across compared to their Western uh, counterparts. Just one sec. Now, the issue is that people with type 2 diabetes, which are able to control and have very well controlled HV1 AC is very low, less than 7%. Only 19.7% people achieve this. And in real world data also is very low, almost one fourth or one fifth percentage of diabetic population have HB1AC well controlled. And this is the big challenge we need to meet out. Now, this is a one of the very interesting slide you must know. We have a plethora of drugs available for management of diabetes. You look at this, that which is the most effective drug to bring about the HB1AC. You see the oral drugs especially like starting from DPP-4 to, to AGI to the thiodylidonidons, sulfonylurea, glenides, metformin, all have capability of reducing hb ac ranging from 0.8 to 1.2. The GLP-1 agonist 1.12. But if you look at this slide, the premix insulin as well as the basal insulins are very effective in bringing down the hb ac and they are highly effective. So the insulin takes away the cake. It leads the ability to bring down the hb one ac This is one of the important aspects in selection of anti-diabetic drug, especially in the later part of the type 2 diabetic patients. There are some key realities of managing diabetes in India. We are a little different than the rest of the world because we have high carb diet. We have high postprandial glucose levels patient uncontrolled of multiple OADs and need for a safety and convenience are there. In fact, all type 2 diabetic patients over the period of time, they become insulinopenic and insulin secreting ability goes down and patient need to be adequately supplemented to have the better glycemic control. The high carbohydrate diet is a common in Indian reality. Look at this, irrespective of the zone you take, whether north, south, east, west, 61 to 70% energy intake in India is through carbohydrate present in diet. So I think that is an important challenge we have. Unlike Western population, post pandemic glucose should be controlled at all levels of HB1AC in Asians. Higher contribution of post pandemic glucose at lower HB1AC levels, similar to Caucasian data from, it has been shown by Monier and et al. And second, significant contribution for post pandemic glucose, even at a higher HB1AC level in Asian, unlike Caucasian has been also shown by the Monier's study. So post pandemic glucose is one of the very important aspect causing higher HB1AC. Does initiating the basal insulin serve the purpose for total control? Yes, it is very important and we need to be very careful about it. Here, I'm trying to share a classical clinical picture that how important the basal insulins are important. Look at, there's a gentleman, Mr. Ashok, who is a 45 year old. He's diabetic for three years and there is no history of hypertension and heart problem, but the issues are his BMI is 27.4, little higher, normal tensive, pulse is fine, weight is 78 kg, little higher, EGFR is 69%, and ophthalmic examination, even with a shorter history, shows mild non proliferative uh, retinopathy, and hb is 8.8, .8, need to be brought down, fasting, glucose is 200, and post Prandial glucose is 240. He has been on metformin 1 gram BD, glimepiride 2 gram BD, citagliptin 100 milligram BD. Now, another lady, Ramaya, 
who is 57 year old lady who is diabetic for 10 years and he has got a peripheral neuritis also with burning feet and numbness of the feet and no history of hypertension or heart problem. BMI is marginally high, 25.8%, eGFR is 74 and again mild NPTR is there. The HVONAC is 9.2, fasting and P P sugars are high at 220 and 290. She is on cetacliptin metformin 50 plus 1000 and glimiparide 2 milligram per day. What should be the next line of therapy? Fourth, where do your insulin? So this is a very important situation which all of us has been coming across in day-to-day -day life. The patient who has a secondary failure, it means in spite of three anti-diabetic drug, having fasting sugar more than 200, constantly losing weight, it is a sign of insulinopenia. Now, what should be our strategy? We need to be very prudent and wise, whether we should add a fourth oral anti-diabetic drug or insulin, which is very important. When to consider insulin in type 2 diabetic patient, there is evidence from real world setting. No further glycemic benefit with addition of four oral anti-diabetic drug as seen in real world Indian setting. And hence, we need to be very careful that what should be our choice. Even if you add the four drug, there's been no improvement in patient's diabetic control. Why to consider insulin in type 2 diabetic patient? Evidence of decreasing oral anti-diabetic efficacy within one to two years from initiation is well established. In meta-analysis by Ovagero et al., DPP-4 inhibitors showed an apparent accepted mean increase in HV1AC of 0.22% after 52 weeks of uses. Loss of glucose-lowering efficacy after two years of treatment was observed with dapagliflozin also. A declining efficacy for SGL2 inhibitors was also observed in meta-analysis by Monami et al. over 104 weeks and decreasing efficiency of oral anti-diabetic drug makes us ponder that why not to add a drug which will bring down the good glycemic control, maybe or injectable. And here, that's we need we think of insulin. There's a very interesting question. Why to consider an insulin in type 2 diabetic patient? Evidence from real-world data shows greater glycemic improvement in insulin receiving versus insulin naive patients that is shown by landmark study. And hence, adding the insulin will bring down the HB1AC better in people who are already receiving the other drugs to the tune of 0.6%. Next question comes to our mind. Once you've decided that you should add on insulin to have the better glycemic control, which insulin to initiate with in type 2 diabetic patient? Premix insulin, the predominantly used insulin in our country at the turn of decade, there is a DICAB study. Proportion of insulin receiving patient is very high with premix insulin to the tune of 52 to 53% comparing basal insulins. And now what happens? The perceived reason behind the greater premix insulin utilization at the turn of decade is it is perceived that premix insulin has a better glycemic response compared to basal insulin. This is partly attributed to dietary pattern among Indians. The high carbohydrate intake, as I already told you in beginning, among Indians result in high postprandial glucose excursion, presumably requiring early use of prandial insulin in addition to basal insulin. However, it is common misconception that premix insulin offer better PPG and fasting glucose control and the safety profile and compensates for the functioning of the basal insulin. That's the reason we need to think in a newer direction. Shift in Indian insulin prescription practices in the last decade has been, look at this, 2011 DICAP study, almost 53% are on premix insulin and look at the landmark outcome ongoing trial that now presently, Almost 54% people are on insulin, basal insulin, while premix percentage has gone to 44%. This is a wonderful chain, a better chain, bringing about the glute glycemic control. As you know, all of us stay in a percentage state of hyperglycemia or postprandial hyperglycemia for 16 to 17 hours a day, which is very important. A steady increase in basal insulin adoption rates since the turn of present decade is very important. 
The reasons for paradigm shifted insulin prescription practices is the accumulating evidence from Glargen 100 pertaining to the following points, fix fasting first, holistic glycemic control, and better efficacy and safety data over the pre-mixed configuration. Three reasons for the paradigm shift. Again, it goes in favor as I talk to you. Higher the HB1AC, greater the fasting plasma glucose contribution data from Asian population. So higher the HB1AC and greater the fasting plasma glucose. Look at this 6 to 6.9 there has been fasting glucose is 51% higher. And look at the HB1AC more than 10%, the fasting glucose is 61%, which is higher. Fasting blood glucose is an independent risk factor of mortality in patient with COVID-19. Recently, all of us faced a big COVID-19. You know, the first COVID-19 wave was progressive, but second wave was very aggressive, led to the sudden surge in the diabetic state of the patient with hyperglycemia. And many of people were new hyperglycemic or diabetic. Fasting disc glycemia, two to three fold higher mortality rates in COVID-19 patient was seen. Mortality rate with fasting glucose more than seven millimoles or that is more than 120 in non-diabetic hospitalized COVID-19 positive patients was higher. And fasting blood glucose higher positions were associated with greater incidence of COVID-associated morbidity and mortality. Hence, it was also proved beyond doubt that uncontrolled fasting glucose, whether COVID or post-COVID or even in non-COVID patient need to be addressed because it contributes significantly to the higher HbA1c, which is directly linked to the micro and macrovascular morbidity and mortality. There's been relationship between fasting blood glucose and risk of being admitted to ICU with COVID-19. And it has been found that people who had a fasting blood glucose more had 1.59 times higher odds of being admitted to ICU. And it definitely led to more morbid and mortality conditions. A small increase within the normal range of fasting blood glucose may be associated with substantial increase in risk of ICU admission of patient with COVID-19. So one of the most important thing is that people with COVID-19 also suffered more diabetic complication by the rise in fasting blood glucose. And that time also people needed more and more basal insulins those who are already on oral drugs or those who are first time naive diagnosed to be diabetic. Glycemic target achieved with the Glargin 100, despite of high baseline HB1AC, two decades of efficacy evidence has confirmed that this is very good in bringing down the HB1AC. A string of studies that showed that insulin glargine by targeting attainment of fasting normal glycemia alone lowered the high HbA1c ranging from 8.5 to 9.1% to even below 7%. So that is the beauty that there was a persistent higher HbA1c and which had a significant contribution by fasting glucose. When coupled up with the basal insulin, it brought down the HbA1c less than 7%. And you know, in India, only one fifth, 20% people have HbA1c less than 7%. Hence, it could bring down the complications in Indian population. Accumulating evidence with Glargin 100 pertaining to the following points, and this has proved that significantly better efficacy and safety data were pre-mixed, which has been confirmed beyond doubt. Fix fasting first. Lowering fasting plasma glucose helps lower the postprandial glucose as well. Normal fasting glucose is bringing down the better complications and it is taken care by basal insulins much beautifully and better. I'll again show you this slide, which is elevated fasting glucose. It is very well taken care of by basal insulins. All the basal levels comes down and patient has a normal fasting plasma glucose. Hence, fix fasting first. I think this triple F is a very important statement. Basal insulin is one which can fix the fasting first and it can bring down 
the HbA1c with lesser complication. Baser insulin provides holistic glycemic control in real world scenario data from Indian real world setting. And this has proved in most of uh, our real world data and landmark has been one of the very effective studies to promulgate this. Targeting fasting normal glycemia with glargine 100 lowers the post prandial glucose. Every two out of three poorly controlled type 2 diabetic patients Pre-mixed insulin achieves target postprandial glucose levels with a switch to glargine 100. Mean two hours postprandial glucose levels decrease from 12 to almost 8.94 millimoles and at the end of 24 weeks. So on significantly, almost a sugar of 190 to 200 came down to the level of almost 140 to 150 milligram percent. And that's the usefulness of this basal insulin in managing the type 2 diabetes. Better efficacy with large in 100 versus premix has also been almost uh, established now. This large in 100 significantly greater patients on target with large in 100 versus premix, almost 44 percent patients are on this comparing the 12 to 13 percent on premix, and this has proven the good results. 20 percent plus greater HbA1c reduction with large in 100 compared to premix insulin has also been promulgated. Lower hypoglycemia risk with large in 100 versus premix is also very important. 50 percent less risk of overall and nocturnal hypoglycemia with large in 100 versus human pacemaker. So one of the very important thing which is patient friendly and one of the reasons of high acceptance of basal insulin is 4.5 percent times lower risk of hypoglycemia with large in 100 versus pre mesk and that is a phenomenal difference and we need to take advantage of this. Significantly lesser weight gain with large in 100 versus pre mix has also been one beyond doubt. And both have comparable hb one ac reduction and greater fasting control with glargine 100 has been documented. 36% lesser weight gain with glargine 100 at 52 weeks and 86% greater overall hypoglycemia has also been seen with Digludec with SPART combination versus glargine 100. Initiating glargine 100 was associated with increased treatment persistence than premix analog, which is also a very important fact to share. Premix insulin is less adaptable method of glycemic control because you know you have fixed doses, you cannot alter that. And that flexibility we get with the basal insulin. Latest 2001 ADA guidelines do not endorse the use of premix insulin in the management of algorithm. I think that's a very important, and I think it is more dependable uses of basal insulin because you can uh, manage it well. ADA 2001 guidelines recommended basal insulin as the most convenient initial insulin regime in patients with type 2 diabetes, and probably it really. Uh, need to reckon with. If you look at this, IDF, RSSDI, ACE and ADA all have gone for basal insulins while IDF, ACE and ADA have not gone in favor of premix very early. Recommended for use during COVID-19 pandemic by Indian experts panel, basal insulin analogs are the simplest and most convenient option, preferably to initiate person on basal insulin during in-person consultation for remote initiation, video consultations are recommended to ease the person into insulin journey. The starting doses of basal insulin analog is 10 units per day or 0.1 to 0.2 kilogram per kilogram per day and that is the great advantage. So if you look at the merits of basal insulin or what you call it to be the glargine 100, it is more physiological, established glucose lowering efficacy over two decades, fasting plasma glucose is brought down below 126 associated with better outcome more so, it has been useful in COVID-19 also. Convenient treatment regime, greater therapy, therapy persistence. Fasting plasma glucose is a major contributor to HB1AC levels. Lowering fasting plasma glucose mitigates postprandial glucose excursions. Preferred for insulin initiation during 
COVID-19 pandemic and supported by global and local guidelines. So truly speaking, basal insulin addition to the later part or even early in a type 2 diabetic patient has been phenomenally useful in bringing down the HB1AC and hence probably the uses of basal insulin in a therapeutic armamentarium is shifting more early, early, early in the management of type 2 diabetes. Thank you very much.